Thank you, General Sullivan. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I would like to thank everyone for certain attending uh, today's panel session. As you can see from the title, it's a, it's a mouthful, but uh, I think it plays very well and it lines up with uh, General Mann's most recent uh, remarks, and you're going to find that now you're going to have a very interactive discussion with some of the, the, uh, the panel members, very distinguished in their own rights, um, highly experienced in this area. Um, my name is Bob Smith. I'm a senior vice president with Booz Allen Hamilton. I lead the firm's Army Acquisition and Sustainment business. But on behalf of Lieutenant General Mann, um, it's my privilege, certainly, to uh, serve as panel moderator for this uh, very important discussion. I am joined by a distinguished uh, panel of military and industry leaders, uh, whom I will introduce momentarily. Our format this afternoon is similar to other ones that you've seen uh, over the course of the last two days. Uh, will consist, consist of presentations from each member, uh, led by uh, Lieutenant General Mann. Following all presentations, and this is most important, we will open it up to questions and answers, time permitting. Uh, please note that during the panel presentations, we will deploy personnel with the question cards who will walk up and down the aisles. You'll also notice uh, microphones that are also in the center aisle, and please feel free to address the panel uh, with your questions that way. Um, so I'd like to read very quickly, step through some bios for the panel members and introduce them formally. Of course, General Mann, who you just heard, he assumed command of the uh, United States Army, SMDC, and the, the Army's Forces Strategic Command and Joint Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense in August of 2013. 2013. He uh, also most recently served as Commanding General of the United States Army Recruiting Command at Fort Knox, where he was responsible for more than 13,000 soldiers and civilians assigned throughout the United States, Europe, and the Far East, with the primary mission, of course, of meeting the Army's recruiting goals. He is a distinguished military graduate of Gettysburg College after graduating from Millersville University. He holds a master's degree from George Washington University and the United States Naval War College. To his right is Major General Samuel A. Greaves. You'll notice in your program it says Admiral Searing, Vice Admiral Searing. Um, who is on, who's on travel is unable to join us today. Um, General Greaves has, has agreed graciously to join us today and to pinch hit for him. He certainly brings a, an enormous amount of experience. He's assigned, of course, as a deputy director, Missile Defense Agency. He was commissioned in 1982 through the ROTC program, graduating from Cornell University. You're going to see a pattern in his, in his bio here in a moment. He has held a variety of assignments, including Headquarters Air Combat Command, the National Reconnaissance Office, uh, and on the air staff with the Directorate of Operational Requirements from the Air Force Colonel Matters Office. He commanded the 45th Launch Group, Patrick Air Force Base, the Launch and Range Systems, Wing and Military Satellite Communication Systems Wing at Los Angeles Air Force Base. He also served as Vice Commander, Space and Missile Systems Center in Los Angeles. Uh, prior to this ass current assignment, he was Director, Strategic Plans, Programs, Analyses, Headquarters, Air Force Space Command at Peterson. He has operational launch crew experience in the Space Shuttle, the Titan, the Atlas, and the Delta Space Launch Systems. He wears the Command Space Badge. Welcome, General Greaves. To his right is Major General Len A. Collier. He became Commanding General of AMCOM on June 1, 2012. Following his assignment as Director of Logistics Operations for the Defense Logistics Agency since August 2, 2010. Prior to that assignment, from June 2008, through July 2010, he served as the 35th Chief of Ordnance at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Maryland, Fort Lee. A native of Huntsville, which is, uh, I think, uh, not too widely known, but, <laughs> but a native of Huntsville, Alabama, he was commissioned in the Ordnance Corps upon graduation from the United States Military Academy in 1979. His military schools include Ordnance Officer Basic, Advanced, CGSC, and the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. He also holds, of course, a master's degree in national resource strategy from the National Defense University in Washington. Welcome, General Collier. Colonel Richards, to his right, is the project manager for the Defense Communications and Army Transmission Systems, PMDCATS. He is responsible for managing programs valued at over $2 billion to support the Army, Joint Services, National Command Authority, and combatant commanders. He's performed duties as uh, XO, as a Deputy Chief Information Officer, G6, Product Manager, Defense-Wide Transmission Systems, Chief uh, of the Force Integration Office for the Program Executive Office, Enterprise Information Systems, and Deputy Project, Project Manager for Defense Data Networks, a graduate of the Military Acquisition Management course and the Command and General Staff College. He received his bachelor's degree from Rutgers. 
and later earned master's degree from the Naval Postgraduate Course uh, School and the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. Now, for our industry colleagues, to his right is Mr. Paul Geary. He's a Boeing Vice President and leader of the C3 Solutions Business Group within the Electronic and Information Solutions Division of Boeing Defense, Space, and Security. It was formed in January of 2013 to advance Boeing capability in the command, control, and communications market. C3 Solutions spans ground control, command and control, airborne C3 networking, uh, combat survivor evader locator radios, and advanced communications. He previously served as the program manager for Boeing's Brigade Combat Team Modernization Program since April 2010 and was previously the integrated product team leader for the C4 ISR team on the BCTM uh, program and its predecessor, FCS. He received his bachelor's from California State University, Long Beach, and master's from Pepperdine. Our final panel member to his right is Mr. Robert Zitz. He has been a senior vice president for the national security sector of Lidos, the firm formerly known as SAIC, since August of 2011. He is a 35-year intelligence community veteran. He has held a variety of leadership positions regarding space, airborne, and communication systems development with the Army Intelligence, CIA, NGA, NSA, and the NRO. He was Deputy Undersecretary of the Department of Homeland Security, um, where he led the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Protection Programs. He has also served as Deputy Associate Director of the United States Secret Service, and that is a different job, where he led modernization activities. He earned his bachelor's from George Mason University and was a senior executive fellow at Harvard University. He's also attended the Federal Executive Institute. So, those are the bios. Please join me in welcoming the panel. So it's now time to begin our discussion. Um, I'd like to first set the stage with a very brief a couple sentences uh, regarding our topic and what it means. It's leveraging space for resilient, assured mission command in an anti-access area denial, that's A2AD, environment. So the United States' ability to counter enemy anti-access area denial, or A2AD, is an urgent strategic priority. Future operations will require U.S. to project substantial military power over considerable strategic and operation, operational distances and face a diverse challenge for dominance across multiple domains. You heard these same thematic statements in General Mann's presentation, including space and cyberspace. Potential future enemies continue to develop a full range of capabilities with the intent to deny, to deny U.S. forces the ability to conduct operations. The Army exists in a current environment of constrained budgets, as we all know, increased lethality of all possible contingency environments, and decreased uh, risk tolerance. If we are to overcome those challenges, we must continue to advance the use of space. Today, this panel brings together some of the premier Army leaders tasked with solving this strategic problem and provides them a forum for discussing their, per their perspectives on defeating adversarial A2AD um, operations. So I would now like to introduce and ask our panel chair, uh, Lieutenant General Mann, to begin his comments, our senior Army, one of the Army's senior air defenders and commanding general of the uh, United States Army Space and Missile Defense Command. General Mann. Thanks, Bob. Can you all hear me out there? I think so. Uh, I'm going to be brief because you kind of just heard me talk uh, for the last 30 minutes, so I don't want to steal the thunder from the other panel members. Uh, but just a couple things I'd like to share. I, I talked about a lot of the threat platforms that are out there that really complicate uh, the A280 uh, environment. Uh, but I also want to make sure that you're, you, you understand that your Army is very much focused uh, on these threats out there. And in fact, if you look at the Chief of Staff of the Army's priorities, uh, next to supporting the warfighter uh, in harm's way, uh, the next highest priorities, space, missile defense, and cyber. And so all the, dis the, the uh, discussions about reducing headquarters, whether it's going to be a 25% for two-star, three-star, and above, uh, I, I can tell you, can't tell you what the number is, but, uh, but we're getting a lot of great support from the senior leaders, leadership, which I'm very, very hap happy to... Uh, to announce. Also, wanted to. The earlier question talked about some of the uh, the coalition and joint uh, relationships and how we can we can utilize that uh, to to benefit our national interests. And I would just say, for military sales, obviously, you know, really kind of helps us get after some of those leap ahead technologies and really kind of 
lower the cost point for uh, some of the uh, advances that we need to make with our own systems. Uh, but also I would, would like to highlight uh, the very collegial and very productive relationship uh, that my command has with uh, Missile Defense Agency. And uh, the fact that Sam's kind of my neighbor, that helps a little bit. Uh, and the fact that I just go across the courtyard and there's MDA has been very helpful in ensuring that warfighter concerns, whether it's through my JIFIC IMD hat supporting STRATCOM or on the Army side of the house, that we convey to the, the material developers what those gaps are. And so that's been very productive and I think it's been also uh, very helpful to be efficient with the very limited resources that we're dealing with. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to, to Sam Greaves. Thank you. Thank you, sir. On behalf of uh, Vice Admiral James Searing, the Director of the Missile Defense Agency, and our, our many, many employees, we appreciate the opportunity to participate on this very, very important panel. I can tell you that we spent quite a bit of time within the agency discussing ways to address this uh, A2AD threat. And to follow up on uh, General Mann's comments, one of um, Admiral Searing's top priorities is to ensure no gaps, no seams uh, between the, the operators and, uh, and the Missile Defense Agency. And we, we take whatever steps we need to ensure that uh, we are communicating regularly, we understand what's tasked, and we deliver with, with the capabilities required. Um, as far as the topic today, um, there are two messages I'd like to leave with you. A bumper sticker, elevator speech, whatever you want to call it. Um, the first is that um, effective ballistic missile defense is critical to regional engagement, and especially in this A2AD area. So that's the first message. The uh, second message is that, that space, as important as it is today, and for all the reasons and capabilities that we get from space today, it is even more important as we head into the future um, with respect to the ballistic missile defense mission. To, uh, to talk about each one of those areas uh, briefly, um, effective BMD provides a more flexible set of blue force operating area options to the combatant commander. And if it works correctly, it also does a number of things which we believe are quite valuable to the combatant commander. It, it uh, provides, uh, provides an additional set of um, complexities to the adversary's decision space, decision calculus, and their decision process. In order to be effective, the BMDS, Ballistic Missile Defense System, must be able to detect launches as early as possible, to track them from birth to death, and then intercept those threats at the optimum point in the, uh, missile in the threat trajectory, which usually occurs uh, in, in the mid-course phase for some systems and in some phases, some systems, as you know, in the uh, terminal phase. To be effective, it must be an integrated, layered and resilient system providing the required combination of persistence, as in being able to see everywhere at all times, discrimination, General Mann talked about that quite a bit, picking out the threat from the chaff, from the garbage, from the distractors that, that come along with, with the threat, battle space and capacity. This takes an integrated and layered sensor network and the ability to coordinate and target through our command networks in an integrated and layered regional uh, ballistic missile defense system. As far as uh, space, space's role today and how it, how it will grow into the future, to be quite honest, we use a combination of um, land, sea, air, cyber, and space-based systems to accomplish the uh, BMD mission. These integrated systems operating in multiple environments using multiple phenomenologies, for instance, radar in combination with infrared systems, and that's valuable because of some systems, some threats that are, are transparent to radar may not be transparent to IR, so using a combination of infrared and radar, we, we feel very confident we can determine the, and discriminate the threat. It makes us, makes, all this makes it possible to deploy that, uh, that layered and resilient BMDS architecture. Space systems operating on the high ground offer the advantage of providing our sensors and communication assets with that persistent access to those areas of interest that we just talked about. Two examples of specifics of what I'm, what I'm addressing here. First example, space capability can play an integral part 
in extending the ballistic missile defense battle space. It's precisely through two sets of capabilities, what we call launch on remote and launch on engage. Essentially, those two capabilities are critical to the A2AD environment, where standoff capabilities may be the most effective way to bring the fight to the region. Tracking ballistic missiles, uh, ballistic missiles from space and transmitting that track data from space-based assets to the BMDS can permit the defender to engage threats earlier and further away from the defended areas and will likely allow opportunities to re-engage the threat if required, thereby increasing depth of fire and decreasing the likelihood of a ballistic missile penetrating the defense. So in effect, with these two capabilities, the sensor can become the limitation and not the kinematics of the weapon. Two examples within the last uh, three years that uh, we've demonstrated these capabilities. First was in FTM-15, Flight Test Maritime uh, Decoded an Aegis Test, back in April 2011, where we deployed in a test environment a remote sensor, the TP-2 forward-based radar, that provided track data to the Aegis system, state vector um, track quality data, where the system was able to develop a fire control solution and successfully intercept an inter intermediate range ballistic missile using SM-3-1A. In this test, we, we demonstrated that we can do launch and remote. In February of last year, uh, another test, Flight Test Maritime 20, FTM-20, we provided quality track data through the command and control battle management system to an Aegis BMD ship to successfully intercept a medium-range ballistic missile with an SM-31A. And that track data was provided from a space asset. FTM-20 was a highly complex test, and it proved the value of an integrated C2 and sensor network in the use of those space-based sensors. It also demonstrated our ability to extend the battle space significantly um, over the, um, as compared to the um, organic uh, Aegis Spy-1 radar um, intercept range. Bottom line is that uh, launch on remote and engage on remote can give our shooters an effective standoff capability. The next area that, uh, that space can be very, very important in, into the future is in providing secure uh, communications, because that's how we pass the track data back and forth from the sensors to, to the shooters. Uh, Joe Mann also talk, um, talked about the, uh, the wideband communications, which, which um, those systems uh, readily provide. So in conclusion, uh, MDA's vision for the, the design, development, and deployment uh, and sustainment of the BMDS is one that is integrated, layered, and resilient, while providing the required combination of persistence, discrimination, battle space, and capacity to execute the mission. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Association of the United States Army and General Sullivan and General Swan for hosting this conference again, another great uh, winner at USA. Uh, I'm going to talk about two things today, uh, a little bit different track than, than the last uh, two have. First, I'm going to talk from the aspect of Aviation Missile Command and the Life Cycle Management Command aspect, and second, from the, the aspect of a logistician. Um, you know, our doctrine says that each commander establishes a mission command system that's based on personnel networks, information, and other things that allows them to conduct operations. Now, you just heard two operational commands talk, and, that, and myself and my command, the Aviation and Missile Command here, as a part of life cycle management, is a part of each of their commands. We're a part of each of the operational commands, and we enable uh, those commands to be successful. Part of what we do is in the personnel side and the network side. Uh, General Greaves here and, and his boss, Admiral Searing, pay for about 80 people from my command to sit in his building and do logistics for systems that ultimately will transfer to the Army. I have people that work with uh, General Mann's uh, staff and at multiple locations around the world to ensure the reliability and capability of missile systems as we do with aviation systems. So 
from the life cycle management command, we are a part of the missile systems that, that revolve around the space from the initiation phase, working with all of the PEOs and the PMs, working integrated in each of their shops, uh, during the design phase, the fielding phase, the sustainment and support, uh, through the whole life cycle and cradle to grave. And what's really important there is ultimately the reliability of those systems helped me again at later on in my position as the logistician on the field and the use of that space. So we also, uh, as General Mann said, it's very important the for military sales aspect of this uh, because that keeps our cost down. It allows us to continually work the upgrade of our systems uh, to provide the most capable system we can to the warfighter. Now, as a logistician, we uh, also, I think uh, General Mann stated in his previous comments about the Army is the biggest user of space, using, utilizing about 60 percent of the space uh, uh, assets or, or requirements. And that's primarily for ISR, for Intel, and other mission command functions. It used to be largely dominated in the mission command by logistics requirements to pass data. Now, with the systems that we've brought on board over the last uh, 12 years through, through two wars, uh, the logistics requirements don't dominate that anymore, but they're still very, very prevalent and, and a requirement. So also we talked earlier, the requirement in peacetime, our daily requirement in order to support both from the product and services, the logistics of what we do across DOD every day, we require all of you to have access to our systems, to know what our requirements are for a product uh, to be purchased or for a service to be provided. So everything we do is based on a, a non-secure network and non-secure systems. What we've got to ultimately do as we go into an uh, anti-access, anti-denial area is again be able to, to work those same systems through unsecure networks, but yet still receive the information and data that we need. Now, as we go back to an expeditionary type of force, there's a lot of training that needs to go on, and, and we've talked about that in many other forums other than this one, but, but the Army today doesn't do that kind of, uh, of, uh, of training. And we, are, we have got to go back, and I think our training centers are going back to that where uh, we will tr train against anti-access, anti-denial, and other things. But there's some logistics capabilities that we can bring to that fight. First of all, it goes back to our job in the, in the uh, development of the systems to make that system as reliable as possible. So we have to provide the least amount of support to it on the battlefield and push the least amount of, of uh, supply forward through an anti-access uh, uh, system. We also can do the same thing with fuel and other commodities that are required. And along the same line, we, can, we also need to know how much that requirement is so that we can push it rather than have to have that comms go back and forth and take up the network to compete against other uh, mission requirements uh, that, are, that, that need to be met through the same system. So a lot of tra training with uh, ISBs. Uh, we've got to train with uh, a redundant systems on the ground using all unsecure, there's no reason why logistic systems can't transition to a commercial-based satellite system instead of using the military and allow the other requirements to be prioritized to the military uh, secure systems. And in many cases, we will continue to preposition supplies and stocks around the world to allow us to have less that needs to be pushed in. Yeah, um, kind of the last thing, and, and General uh, Cardone talked about this this morning, is compromised networks. We need to know enough about our systems to be able to continue to operate on a compromised network and still understand what valid requirements are versus something that could be bogusly emplaced within that system uh, by a compromised network and continue to use it to, to meet the requirements of the logistician and ultimately the operational command on, on the ground. So uh, in order to save time, I will be followed by Colonel Richards. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon. First, uh, I'd like to thank uh, General Sullivan and AUSA for the opportunity to sit on this very distinguished panel. Uh, can you give me the first slide, please? Next slide. <clears throat> okay, I'm Colonel Clyde Richards, and I'm the project manager for the Defense Communication and Army Transmission Systems. I manage a diverse portfolio of communication systems 
that consists of six major programs, over 130 projects, and we execute on the order of about half a billion dollars uh, per year. Next bill, please. Now, essentially, uh, my core competency or our core competency is in long haul communications, both in terrestrial, we do on the terrestrial side, we do uh, long haul fiber, tech control facilities, microwave systems, and things as such. We're also responsible for long haul satellite communications. Um, PMDCAS is responsible to the Army for the ground segment of the wideband uh, mil military satellite communications segment. So we implement uh, the ground segment infrastructure, uh, such as uh, satellite terminals, as well as we're, we're responsible for implementing the wideband control systems that control the payloads on the satellites. Next slide, please. So on the topic today, um, satellite SATCOM networks are essential to effective mission command operations in practically any environment. It enables decentralized command and control, freedom of action, and situational awareness which means any disruption can cause catastrophic, a catastrophic impact to mission command operations. Now our adversaries are fully aware of that and they are exploiting that by employing electromagnetic uh, jamming techniques and uh, capabilities to prevent the access and to prevent the freedom of action. Now this has been the case for years, nothing new. However, it's more of a threat today because of our dependency on SATCOM. Now, jamming, most of you probably understand what jamming is, but if you don't, just a simplified example, uh, just imagine two people having a conversation, and then you have a third person who uh, wants to disrupt that conversation. Uh, the third person comes or joins or the close proximity of those two individuals and uh, has a radio and turns the radio volume all the way up to disrupt this conversation between the two individuals. Essentially, that is deliberate uh, uh, event in, in jamming. So when you talk about two satellite terminals communicating over uh, a satellite and uh, there's a electromagnetic interference um, that, that, uh, that is infiltrated into the transmissions and perhaps disrupts it, that is an instance of jamming. So to counteract that, we employ uh, anti-jamming uh, capabilities. And the issue is, is that it can be very complex and it can be very costly, which today, and I'll talk about here in a minute, um, has resulted in a lack of protection. Now, this threat is real, um, it's prevalent, it is pervasive, and it's persistent. And as noted on the, uh, the two, uh, uh, last two bullets on my slide there, um, there are documented accounts of hostile uh, attacks on uh, US transmissions and OIF. And, and this is happening on a frequent and daily basis. Next slide, please. So because of the, uh, the cost and complexity, most of the mill SATCOM uh, domain is unprotected from jamming. So the basic architecture for the mill SATCOM domain consists of three segments, the narrow band segment, the wide band segment, and the protected segment. Of course, the protected segment is the most protected against physical and electronic uh, threats. Now the trade-off there is it's, it, it's very costly and you could have uh, a degradation in performance uh, because of it. Now as far as the narrow band and the wide band, they're the most vulnerable um, and primarily because it's unaffordable or cost prohibitive to, to actually incorporate or implement uh, the same measures that you have in the protected segment. So as PMDCATS, I'm responsible for the, the infrastructure in the wide band um, segment, and we're responsible for not only implementing the infrastructure, but also solutions to try to protect uh, the transmissions that would occur uh, within that domain. Of course, ideally, we want to pursue low cost and high performance solutions, but in many cases, it's not really available today. So what are we doing about it? Next slide, please. So as you can imagine, there are many different types of uh, jamming methods and techniques that exist out there. Well, there's, there's also a number of different approaches to getting at anti-jam uh, capabilities and solutions. And in uh, PMDCAS, we are concentrated or focused really in these three areas. While there's other, other solutions out there, these are the ones that, um, that we're working on currently. So when it comes to uh, geolocation, essentially, that is, um, 
uh, being able to detect where a jamming event is occurring from so you can defeat it. And as far as the satellite gain discrimination or beam shaping, that's the ability or capability to be able to shape the beam and avoid uh, a jamming uh, threat. In both of those initiatives, um, we are um, modifying the current wideband control platforms to incorporate those capabilities. From a technical standpoint, it hasn't really been uh, challenging. The, the uh, technology is, is, is uh, available to us and we're working on it. Um, our challenge has been funding. Now, as far as the, the third one there, the AJ modem processing gain, um, essentially that is just adding AJ capability to existing waveforms in, in our modems. And um, that has, we've been working on that for the past couple of years. Um, that has not only been a funding challenge, but also been a technical challenge for us to, to get there. So if you go to the next slide, these are, uh, these are a few initiatives that we, we've been working on. Now these three different solutions have um, specific mission threats, so they're customized for those specific threats. Um, but this kind of gives you a sense of, over time, um, how we've been pursuing uh, better performance at a lower cost. So on the first one, it's a legacy, legacy solution. It's been around for a number of years, and, uh, and it's actually nearing end of life. But you can see there, from a protection standpoint, um, that solution has been very effective in protecting against um, multiple types of anti-jamming threats. But it, the trade-off has been in the, in the throughput, right? Throughput has been low, and then uh, it's been very costly. Whereas um, in an air-term solution that we're working on currently, um, we've been able to see a, uh, a, when it says moderate, it really should say high because that is a specific solution that meets the requirements for that particular mission set, but it doesn't have the same capabilities as, the, as a legacy. So from a protection level standpoint, it is, um, it is a, a solution that meets the requirements, but you can see that the throughput is much higher. And uh, in this case, it has been very expensive to get there, but we are, are getting better at it. And then the, uh, and then the third one there is just some R&D and R&D &E effort that we're working on. And uh, we're just looking really to optimize um, the trade-offs. So we're really trying to get to that high performance and the low cost um, solutions. Next slide, please. So the real, the real key takeaway here that I'm really uh, focused on is to talk about the importance of anti-JAN capability in protecting um, the MILSATCOM domain, expanding that, um, that capability, because it's essential to resilient and assured mission command uh, operations in the A2AD environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, so as, um, as everybody has said, I really appreciate the opportunity to represent uh, industry and Boeing here at the uh, AUSA advance. Um, the topic today is uh, network simplification as an enabler for assured mission command in a contested environment. I, I really appreciated seeing the General Mann's video. It brought back uh, some personal memories for me as uh, my first job at the Boeing Company was uh, working on um, a ground-based interceptor uh, tech test of the homing, homing overlay experiment out of Kwajalein Islands and, and seeing that uh, uh, picture brought back memories. Also, um, of course, at Boeing, our, our team is uh, highly motivated and engaged in working on the, the Hell MD program that was um, that was discussed in the video. And in in my background in um, at Boeing included some time in the advanced uh, space and technology world where um, I launched the first uh, nanoset programs that we had there and also was uh, involved in the initiation of the X-51 hypersonic development program. So um, appreciated seeing that video. What I'm going to focus on is um, taking space and communications and networking to more of the tactical edge um, from some of the strategic capabilities that were talked about in the early um, discussions and then taking what Colonel Richards discussed a little bit further. Um, it, it appears that uh, over the last few years um, we've seen the importance of technology and communications and, and space communications in particular um, support the, the mission command function 
for the Army and the, and the defense to, um, in general. But it's been in a very um, far less permissive environment, or a very permissive environment than what we expect to see in the future. Um, what I'd like today to do today is uh, briefly lay out some thoughts and stimulate some thinking, perhaps, about some balance. Um, one thing I believe we can see occurring is a network of networks that's increasingly complicated technically and a user force that's challenged to employ and manage uh, that capability operationally. As we uh, assume Mission Command and its uh, networks will be increasingly challenged from outside threats, as we're discussed, the last thing we need to have is some of those important mission command functions and systems threatened by their complexity from the inside. Um, and what we'll see is a, a double-edged um, problem there uh, going forward. So if you go to the next slide. So set, to set that stage, what we see is a mission command environment under pressures of technology and complexity, as well as the budget limitations um, that the Army faces. And there's a variety of physical, electronic, and cyber threats from the outside. At the same time, we have to wean ourselves from the do-whatever-you-want environment that we've seen um, recently in Southwest Asia. And we realize we can't assume that that permissive environment, um, even though there are real threats, they're probably not as significant in the recent past as they will be in the near future. We have to think about re-delivering capability from CONUS um, base. That means capability packages are mobile, flexible, trainable, manageable, and conditions that range from modern to austere. Our enemies understand that complex systems after uh, having more chinks in their armor than the simple systems, and so must we. At the same time we employ these capabilities against increasingly complex threats, mixes of conventional and unconventional, symmetric and asymmetric, and so on, together with increasing appreciation of how dependent we're becoming on IP-based networks. So in order to succeed in these environments, we have to have a highly integrated, interoperable, and streamlined mission command capability that's enabled by comms and networks with the same attributes. And we're working toward that with the Army, Army's common operating environment and a set of more streamlined mission command applications on that uh, common operating environment. While they're working towards the network of networks, we're slowly coming to understand and amid its own complexities, but that's hard and will take time. The network integration evaluation, or NIE venue, is critical to that as part of the Army's agile process for implementing these networks. Next chart, please. But it's important to understand what I think we're seeing and not seeing out of the NIE. And that's, this is all based on public reports that emerge as we got from one iteration to the another. But it talks to complexity and what we're learning about that complexity. First, we're seeing a, com a combination of mission command and the network become very complex, even without all the various um, mission command functions. I think what we've seen in NIEs um, over the last few years is a, a largely a focus on C2 and fires integration and not some of the more complex ISR uh, mission sets and even, even some of the data traffic um, hungry uh, logistical applications. So uh, aviation and full scope logistics remain to be introduced um, significantly into that NIE environment and we need to remember that these functions are historically drivers of network bandwidth and burden and performance. We're seeing network planning and management consume far more time, and that means more resources than they should, and we're playing catch up to the network development itself. The greatest th threat to assured mission command right now is the complexity and the time associated with network planning and management and the ability of mission leaders to react to that task organization changes. At the same time, I think we're seeing great challenge with operators and field commanders at levels actually using these capabilities, again, due to the complexity in those systems. So before we complicate further things further, we need to understand with a better eye on CONOPS training and TTPs, but also with a critical eye on streamlining and simplifying it. And I think that's the message we're hearing out of NIE. Next chart. 
So the point of this slide is not to, um, is not to focus on the capabilities, but just, just to simply show that growing the capabilities and that interconnectivity in an OV-1 like shown there, that support mission command from space to ground, it's also uh, to suggest that the more interconnections we show, the more vulnerabilities and in Murphy invent interventions we risk. And the more complex it becomes, the harder it is to test, evaluate, understand, and protect. And we ought to think about that and have a debate about what it means to be operationally right looks like in, in contrast to what's technically feasible, because we talk a lot about new technology. And today's budget limitations are certainly going to compel the conversation as they already have, and I hope industry is part of that discussion. Next chart. So what do we need to, to succeed going forward with the mission command in contested environments? We need a primary network of networks that's complete, however incrementally it may be developed. We need to thoroughly understand its connections, capabilities, and performance. And it needs to be trainable and operable without the legion of field technicians that sometimes have to surround networks today. Having done that, we need to understand and develop, if necessary, ro robust backups and our other alternatives to communicate and command in the face of those threats that Colonel Richards uh, described. We have an increasingly high dependence on space-based SATCOM, for example, and there are many expectations of service and performance, especially in space and spectrum constraint contested environments. We have to get control over complexity, maximizing what we need to happen in mission command while su support, while minimizing and mitigating the risk that it won't support the mission. This won't go well if it's an afterthought. You don't bolt on simplification or systems engineer simplicity after the fact. And I have some scar tissue to um, prove that from my recent past in trying to put this tactical capability out there. That said, as we mature modern mission command and its networks, we're going to find that there are places where technology can make positive differences, mitigate problems and risks, and improve performance. And industry and other uh, significant upper, uh, capabilities that way, and we need to be engaged up front with a good degree of transparency about those problems and risks. Last slide. If we want all the operational advantage to happen, and as, the, as, um, as against the grain as it may seem to some of you, we have to think simplify and streamline along the path to achieving it. And I think we're on the verge of seeing this as the network comes together and a new generation of mission command comes to use it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks again to AUSA and General Mann for an opportunity to be on the panel. I'm going to kind of hit a few highlights so we have time for questions. But um, what I wanted to do was stimulate a little bit of thinking about uh, the challenges associated with going to those small sets that we heard one of the questions of General Mann, is, are we there, is it time now for small sets? But then some practical uh, ideas about how to break through any barriers that continue to remain. Uh, first, I'd tell you my formative years, first 11 years were as an Army intelligence civilian, and then uh, frankly the next 30 years I was a covert Army type inside of other three-letter agencies trying to make sure they did what the Army needed. And, and I can tell you over those decades that I was always amazed and, and continue to be amazed at how Army drives the changes that occurred. I mean, it didn't really matter which of the three-letter agency you're talking about. You can pull a thread back and find that many of the systems, development systems that exist today uh, had uh, Army requirements as part of their, um, their legacy. And just to give you a few examples of that, we've talked about communications and high bandwidth and so on, but also compression algorithms to make sure you could move data to, to uh, disadvantaged users. Uh, things like change detection, synthetic aperture radar, uh, overhead persistent infrared, UAVs. You know, we now think of UAVs or unmanned uh, air reconnaissance vehicles as ubiquitous. Really, Army was already showing the way on that back in Gulf War I with Hunter and then uh, again in Bosnia and so on. Uh, mobility, you name it, you can just all the way go down through the list. And I would submit to you that uh, the changes that need to happen in ISR, um, some of them are hard, some of them are political, cultural, programmatic, but Army can push, and I'm glad Army's the one who is pushing it. Um, it's, if anybody uh, says to me, and I hear, I hear naysayers sometimes talking about small satellites, 
say, yeah, it's too hard, won't there? Why does Army need ISR assets in space? And I'll remind people that, well, actually, the Army's already been there in space. And I'm talking about 1989 when uh, Chief Warrant Officer Tom Hennon was the first intelligence officer in space on a space shuttle mission on Terra Scout 1, and then there is Terra Scout 2, so Army showed the way. Um, is it difficult? Yeah, it's difficult. Um, but I think we've got a perfect storm that's, that's formed up now. We've got three, uh, th three or four things that have converged. One is the contested space. You know, the, the President's uh, national space policy in 2010 talks about needing to be able to operate through a contested environment. And of course, what we mean by that is near peer uh, cyber and kinetics, and we've seen what's happened in that regard. By the way, a lot of people, including uh, obviously General Mann sp spoke to it, but you hear General Shelton just two or three weeks ago in George Washington University in Washington stood up and gave a pretty eloquent speech about the need for distributed architectures, low cost, small satellites to be able to move forward. So one is the contested space issue. The other is that we no longer have the promise of universal immediate air superiority. We've lived 13 years in an environment thinking, you know, we don't have that as a problem to worry about. We put our UAVs in there, we go after it. Well, that's not gonna be the case necessarily uh, in lots of the world as we move forward. So you don't have that. You need an ability to have more than um, more than what's available at the uh, weeks later or months later. I think about uh, 82nd Airborne coming off the green ramp down at Bragg and having to go into a forced entry environment, or the Marines doing the same, and I'm wondering, are we gonna just kinda say, hey, we'll get there when we can with our ISR assets, or when we talk about A2AD and having to stand off with our weapon systems, well, our ISR systems are having to stand off as well. Yes, we have national technical means, but are they going to be optimized or focused on the tactical warfighter? Uh, it's, it's a thing you've got to take a look at. That, so you've got the, 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 that issue. Then the budget pressures, and some might say this is actually the driver. I mean, we are in an environment right now, which I don't think we've seen since the 90s and the drawdown in the 90s, where there's tremendous pressure to reduce budgets, and that includes on some of the larger programs of record, including space-based. And so getting the lower cost systems, as what uh, General Palakowski was doing at SMC with commercially hosted infrared payload as an example, Truth in Advertising, my firm was the one that had, had built that sensor. But the idea of on pennies on the dollars to be able to go after a large share of requirements at low cost. Um, and then you add to those threads, those pressure points, the Army intelligence enterprise uh, draw, changing and morphing itself to be an enterprise operation with reach back capabilities. So, so there are pressures that I think have mounted that are driving and combined can make the breakthrough required to move to smaller satellites. Some will say, well, you know, it's fun with science. No, it's not. Right now, as we're talking, there's a satellite, a commercial satellite called Skybox that orb orbits the Earth. It's taking better than one meter video, 90-second video clips at high definition. Uh, and the, the only reason it's a, a slightly less than one meter is because the orbit that it got launched into was high. I mean, if you brought it down a little bit lower, you'd get better quality. You heard the general talk about Kestrel I, you know, there are ideas about something called Nano I, which would be better than one meter. Uh, there are capabilities that exist today. I'm a big believer in, in the idea that it fly it low enough that if you have to see a contrail behind it, that's fine, but at least gets the quality and so forth that you need to do the job as the job needs to be done. So some practical ideas, and then, uh, and then I'll, uh, in my comments, is uh, it's really important that as uh, end users or the Army or any other end user who's thinking about small sats goes forward and justifies it, that the critical gap, the gap that exists uh, that is not answered by other larger, more expensive systems, that that can be well articulated. And then it's really important then as you lay that out that you stick to that gap and that we don't start to have mission creep or Christmas tree ornaments added to it that drives up cost and complexity. I think another thing that's important to note is that uh, particularly when you're talking about this and people want to make comparisons to large programs of record, um, that we don't talk about replacing, we talk about complementary assets and supplementary assets. I mean, if we have a near peer use cyber or kinetic against us in a hot war, we're going to have to have some capabilities to be able to complement and supplement at the strategic level, 
not even at the tactical that we've been mainly talking about here today, but that's an important way to talk about it to avoid uh, pitfalls in discussions. Then, then I would just add kind of quickly that some of the more technical things that need to be considered, quality. When we talk about small set quality, uh, to get out of the uh, science project realm, we've got to make sure that the sensors of sufficient quality to be able to answer the need. And generally, that's going to be less than one meter uh, quality. And you can get that by coming down in, in lower altitudes. Uh, uh, revisit rates, optimize the orbit to go after the uh, area of interest. Lifespan, I know of demonstrations where they're intended to go on orbit for two years because we've just spent some money on it, we want to have it for a couple of years and we'll fly it in a higher orbit, but then that lifespan, okay, you get a couple of years, but then you don't get the quality you want. Don't worry about lifespan, shorten the lifespan and get the, get the revisits and the quality you want and make sure that whatever is put together is an end-to-end -end capability, including ease of use for an ability as the soldier to tap into it, to get it, to make sure it's an end-to-end -end capability. Because if it can't be plugged in, end-to-end, -end, and if it won't touch an enterprise operation, there are going to be questions about it. So I look forward to, to uh, answering any questions you might have about Excellent. those thoughts. Thank well, thank you to all our <laughs> panel members for their insightful remarks. It's uh, very enlightening. I learned a great deal. Now is the time, really, for the in interactive part. Uh, we're going to entertain some questions. We received several, and we have arrayed them appropriately to several, uh, to several of our panel members to address. So, General Mann. Okay. Thanks, Bob. A uh, couple questions that I received. One. Uh, uh, given that the Army's developed small nano satellites uh, to provide A2AD capability and support of the entire force, the question is, what is the Army's commitment to deploying small nano satellites and launch capability to space and tra transition to an Army program of record? And uh, we all know that, you know, to be able to get to a program of record uh, decision, you have to make sure that you're able to show the robustness, the performance. Uh, the necessary cost points, um, the survivability. This is, uh, like I said before, very promising technology. We've only launched two so far. We're still learning from that. Uh, so I, we have a little ways to go before we're able to take it to a program of record level decision. Uh, but, but what we're seeing so far is very, very promising. So I just say more is, uh, more is to come. Uh, the second uh, question that I received was, can you give us an appreciation for the Air Force Space and Missile Defense Command, MDA, SMDC, complementary capabilities for missile defense? Uh, we'll tell you that uh, the other uh, hat that I wear as far as Joint Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense, where I work uh, directly for uh, Admiral Haney, uh, I work very, very closely with the Air Force with uh, JIFIC Space. Uh, to ensure that we're complementary, uh, that uh, good situational awareness. Uh, in terms of, we, we talked about the satellites that we have up there. If you think of it in terms of the Air Force is kind of driving those satellites up there, whereas our operation centers, those Army soldiers that we have around the world, they're kind of controlling the platforms. They're kind of controlling uh, what comes off the platforms in terms of supporting COCOM requests uh, for space-enabled communications. Uh, obviously, the Air Force, uh, you know, approves off on a lot of that, uh, has a lot of the authorities in terms of the approval process along with that, but we work very, very closely with them. In terms of missile defense, uh, we utilize Cobra Dane, you know, that, that, uh, that very impressive, dated though, uh, capability that we have in Alaska in terms of not only does it allow us uh, to have good visibility with what is in orbit in terms of debris and, and cataloging uh, the different things that are up there flying, but also gives us uh, the, the track fidelity that we need to be able to launch GBIs. So we work very, very closely with, uh, uh, with the Air Force uh, in, in terms of that program. MDA obviously leads, uh, leads the charge as far as the sea base expand radar that is ported in uh, in Honolulu, and uh, so that's another capability that provides us with that, that, that discrimination that we need to be able to uh, uh, put a missile in the air. So again, a lot of close collaboration between the Air Force, uh, MDA, the Navy uh, on, these, uh, on these capabilities. Thank you, sir. And our next question, General Greaves. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, let's see, it says, please provide an update on the East Coast missile field 
and on the European based sensor field. Um, let's see, as far as the first part of the question, the East Coast Missile Field, you know, I offered uh, uh, two bumper sticker uh, thoughts on the way out. This is the third. The, the third is that uh, the Secretary of Defense has not made a decision to deploy an East Coast Missile Field, CONUS Interceptor Site, however else it may be termed. And I'll say it again, the Secretary of Defense has not made a decision to deploy an East Coast Missile Field, and that's very important. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what the agency was tasked to do in last year's uh, uh, NDAA was to essentially, in partnership with the combatant commanders, primarily NORTHCOM and STRATCOM, um, study options for a location, a preferred location for an East Coast mission missile field, should that decision be made in the future. Um, that work has essentially been completed, and uh, Admiral Searing is leading the staffing within the Department of Defense. Um, to um, fully explain uh, the options available to us, and we're proceeding with the environmental impact statement, which, which, was, which was also directed by the Congress in the NDAA, and that's nominally a 24-month uh, process, which will be heavily influenced by um, the, uh, the interaction with the public and the detailed site survey um, uh, analyses that we intend to do to, to arrive at a recommended site. As far as the uh, European-based sensor field, um, otherwise known as the European Phase Adaptive Approach, uh, phases two and three, phase two uh, uh, headed to Romania, and phase three to Poland, uh, both of those activities are on track to be delivered in uh, 2015 for phase two to Romania and 2018 for Poland. Um, we've broken ground in Romania and activities are progressing uh, as expected. Hopefully, it answers the question. And I believe we have one more question for Colonel okay, Richards, so, please, uh, quickly. No, so have, co have contracts been issued for geolocation, et cetera? You indicated that you have a solution for the first two challenges, but for the third, have some technical issues. So first of all, I apologize if I gave the impression that we, uh, we have uh, the geolocation and the beam shaving on contract. We do not have it on contract. Um, we understand the requirements, and we've done the market research, and we have not done the solicitation. What I did indicate on the slide is that um, the challenge for us really is the funding. So what's holding up us uh, with, that, with that effort really is getting the funding to be able to do it, and it's quite expensive. So that effort is uh, really uh, beyond really my office and my ability to be able to do anything about, and that's being worked. So we're waiting for that to, uh, to come. Uh, with respect to the to the uh, to the modems um, and the te technical issues, also apologize. I gave the impression that we have technical issues, not necessarily the way that I would um, describe it. Um, we have it, it's a very technical, technically um, complex um, development. So there's challenges associated with getting to the development. Um, it, we've been working on it for uh, you know over two years now and probably another year before we get to the solution. So it's not that, uh, that there are issues, it's just the point I was really trying to convey is that it's very complex to get to those type of solutions. Okay, thank you very much, Ben Richards. And uh, General Men, I'd like to leave you with the last word. Any closing remarks? Uh, what i just leave you with is that uh, there is a lot of collaboration uh, that is taking place uh, between uh, my organization, uh, MDA, the Air Force, uh, because we all understand uh, the growing relevance uh, of space and missile defense, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting time, we'll say that. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. Appreciate it.